Creator of Jesus, Creator the Great I Am. He gave the only begotten to come and redeem us, the lost race of fallen man. Sing. I'm going to take you to Psalm 33. Psalm 33 in your Bibles. Well, God is powerful and His might should fill our hearts and our minds when we look out. Folks, the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord, all you righteous. If we can't praise Him for the righteousness that He has given us, Rejoice in the Lord, all you righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. It makes you beautiful to praise the Lord. When I come in on Sunday morning, I love to greet you. I like to smile at you. A lot of you smile back at me. Makes you so much more beautiful when you smile. Compliments your outfits and your makeup and your hair when you smile. But it's the beauty of the Lord that I like to see, the testimony of Christ. Maybe even the testimony of someone looking for Christ when they see the righteousness of God and they want that. Folks, praise the Lord with the harp. Sing unto Him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings and the bass and the keyboard and, and the drums. Whatever you can do, praise the Lord. Sing unto Him a new song in the Bible. And you can research this. Look through and see how many times you see that, that phrase, new song. It's only used a few times in the Psalms and in Revelation. And every time it's used, it's not talking about a brand new song that somebody makes up and puts a tune to. Or a new uh, rap beat. It's talking about a fresh, new salvation from the Lord. Every time you see that word new song, it's talking about our faith in Christ changing us from what was old to something new. It's salvation. And we need to sing about our salvation and play skillfully with a loud noise for the word of the Lord is right. What did the word of the Lord do? When God spoke, 
and created the heavens and the earth and the mountains came forth and the land and the sea. God's Word was what caused all of that. The Word of the Lord, His breath, the breath of the Almighty. Folks, that's how powerful the Word of the Lord is. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, John chapter 1, and dwelt among us. That's the Word of the Lord. You see, that's how powerful He is. He loveth righteousness. And judgment, the earth, is full of the goodness of the Lord. When I look at the mountains here or anywhere that we live in the middle, you can stand on our front porch and see the Blue Ridge Mountains. When I look at those mountains and I see the majesty of God before me, and I say the love of the Lord is there. God's grace to create the trees, to create the snow, to replenish this earth is there in those mountains. The love of God surrounds us. His creation supports us. The fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, support us. So we shouldn't take a breath without praising the Lord. Look at verse 7. He gathereth the seas, the water of the sea, together in a heap. You know, there was once a great flood on this earth in Noah's day, and it was brought because of sin. It was brought because man sinned and God was destroying every creature on this earth except for Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Thank God for grace. When God dispersed the waters from that flood, He created things like the Grand Canyon, like the glacial plains. God created the shape of this earth by the waters. And verse 7 says, Together as a heap, he layeth up the depth in storehouses. The great oceans are the storehouses for God's water. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Now, we're good at that. That's right, preacher. Let everybody else on the earth fear the Lord. China needs to fear the Lord. India needs to fear the Lord. The Polynesian islands need to fear the Lord. Everybody needs to fear the Lord. We love to sing that, don't we? All of Alaska ought to fear the Lord. Virginia ought to fear the Lord. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Man, if those presidents and that Congress, if those inhabitants would just stand in awe of God, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Keep reading with me. Uh, verse 9 says, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught, and he maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Oh, well, I thought if all the Congress was saved, that everything would go right. I thought if, uh, if all the Supreme Court judges knew the Lord, that everything would be perfect. No, it wouldn't. Because we live in a world of sinners, and I look at you and you look at me, and what is our favorite greeting? How are you today? I'm good. I always like to say to the cashier, the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. For all have come short, fallen short of the glory of God. But praise the Lord, we can be good in Christ. We can do the will of the Father. But look at verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. He the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. I want you to look at this picture. What do you see forming, just kind of delicately forming out of that picture? And what do these things represent? Can somebody holler it out? What do you see up here? The flag of the United States of America. Does anybody know what the stars represent on that flag? States, and if I know constitutionally, if you read your constitution, you ought to be reading it because the Constitution of the United States says that every star stands for individual people, that you have to have a certain number of people come together and petition the government to form a state. So my daughter Kelly asked me on the way up, why is Alaska a state? I think it was, maybe it was Sarah. Why is Alaska a state being so far away from us? When you have to drive through two or 3,000 miles of Canada to get here, why is it a state? I said, because people, individual people got together 
And together they said, we want to be represented in the United States. And they petitioned the United States government and the government granted them. Stay. These stars represent individual people, which is Psalm 33, 12, that says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. How does God bless a nation? Through individual people. When you see the stars on the flag, do you realize that they represent individual people? That our United States is not made of a government. It's not a set of policies. It's people governed by people for the common good of the people. God said that he would bless any nation whose people would, would turn to Christ, would humble themselves under his leadership. And he says, here the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. How do you get chosen by God to be a child of God and take part in the inheritance of heaven? How do you get chosen? In Christ. When John chapter 1, if we go back to the Gospel of John, and he said, He came unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, Jesus Christ, and said, Come into my heart, Jesus, I want you as Lord of my life, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the right to become the children of God. Wow. And God says in Psalm 33, Blessed is the nation, not just the United States, blessed is any nation whose God is the Lord and whose people will turn to salvation in Christ alone. So whenever you win, a, you want America to be great, you want Alaska, you want Anchorage, do you want the Philippines to be great, do you want a, a Samoan island to be great, do you want any place, China, Iraq, Iran, Israel to be great, lead one person to Jesus Christ. And their life... Your life will bless your family, your community, your city, town, your state, and your nation. Wow. One soul. So when you go back to school, I remember going to school in seventh, eighth grade. I wanted my friends to come to know Jesus. And I'd take them tracks in high school. I was putting revival flowers on the wall of the school, public school. I, was a, I think they really looked at me as a freak. I thought I was normal. But, uh, you know, I found out later they kind of looked at me as a preacher boy. I didn't even know I was called to preach. But I wanted people to know Jesus because I felt like if they knew Jesus, that they would bless their family and their community in America. Look, read on with me. The Lord looketh from heaven, and he beholdeth all the sons of men. God looks down, and he's looking at every individual person. You're a child of God. In the broader sense, he's looking at his creation. He beholdeth all the sons of men, and from the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. So he's not just looking at Christians. He's looking at every single individual. That, you, that came out of the mother's womb by God's creation. And look what he says. He fashions all their hearts alike. So the Lord looks and he's looking at your heart. Not just at somebody else. Not at your grandma. God's not looking at your daddy's heart and your mother's heart. He's looking at your heart. Yeah. You can't be saved by your mama's faith or your brother's faith or your daddy's faith. You can't be saved by your grandmother's faith. Amen. Come on. You're saved by your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. But notice he says, He fashioneth all their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. Now let me ask you this. If you just think of what God knows about you, which is everything, He knows everything you say, everything you do, if he just considered my works, do you know where I would go in eternity? To hell. Because the Bible says in Revelation that they shall be judged. All those that stand at the great white throne will be judged according to their works, out of the books of works. And they will be cast in the lake of fire, and death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire. And that's the second death by their works. And God sees our works, and our hearts are dark with sin. 
And by the way, in our hearts, which is the seat of our emotion, our will, everything that we believe or own, we have a throne. You ever thought about that? That on your throne of your heart, you've put something. Now, some people say, well, I, I'll tell you what. You can have revival or you can have church service, but with my ball team's playing, I'll be at home watching them. In our area, they'll be traveling out of state to watch them. I'll tell you what, preacher, I've got more important things to do than spend all my time with the Lord. So whatever you put on your heart, God knows what's on the throne of your heart. He fashions all of our hearts alike. He knows your likes. He knows your dislikes. He knows what you prefer and what you do with your time and your talents. God knows everything. And you can't hide your heart from the Lord. You can, uh, you can fake it in front of us. You can put on a smile when you really feel sad. You can, uh, you can do all kinds of things to fake it for the preacher, but you cannot hide from the Lord God of heaven. He sits on his throne and looks at our throne of our heart. There is no king saved by a multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. In other words, you can't have enough money. You can't have enough power to deliver your soul. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his strength. And behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. So I want to ask you, what is on the throne of your heart? Who do you fear today? Who is your leader? The, the Lord God of heaven? Or is it a personal preference? Or maybe sin? You know, here's some terrible statistics about sin these days and how involved people are with the wrong things. And you know what's wrong and you know what's right. Folks, who is on the throne of your heart? What is on the throne of your heart? Is it God or is it self? God is looking at your heart from above and he knows what you do and what controls your heart. But look at this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him. If we put Jesus Christ on the throne of our heart, right in the dead center, and say, everything I do is determined by Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to save me from my sin. He gave His life for me. Jesus Christ died to give you life. And when you receive Christ and you say, I want Jesus to be in my heart, to be controlling my life. Look what it says. The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, that give Him respect and reverence. Upon them that hope in His mercy. You see, I don't hope in my works to get me to heaven. I hope in the mercy of God. God, forgive me for my selfish works. Forgive me for my failures. 